So tonight we're going to be doing the OT4 lesson, which is your fourth diver, uh, fourth ocean diver lesson in dive planning. So how do you actually plan these dives? Um, so what we're going to be covering is the actual practicalities of planning the dive, what that actually means and what we need to do for it. So decompression planning, the instruments that we use to do that and monitor our plan, the differences between dive tables and dive computers, the complications added by altitude diving, as well as the effects that flying can have after diving. We're also going to be talking about oxygen toxicity, which is probably a new concept for you, you guys, as well as gas consumption planning. It's going to be a relatively brief overview of all these topics, and we'll go into a bit more detail in a later lecture, um, but it's to give you an idea that these exist. So decompression planning. Hands up those who don't know what decompression illness is. It's fine if you don't, just so I know what I'm working with. OK, that's fine. So very quickly, decompression is where you have uh, nitrogen bubbles that form in your body, either in your blood or in your tissues that cause damage. It's bad. OK, so as we know, we breathe pressurized gas at depth and that creates a greater gradient of nitrogen from the gas we breathe, which contains nitrogen, into our body. So nitrogen absorbs. And as we come up, that gas or what we do, what we say is off gassing, where the nitrogen de-absorbs from our body, so to speak. Uh, if we do it too quickly, it'll form bubbles rather than just diffusing into our lungs. And that can cause damage. So we plan around this to make sure it doesn't happen because it's not good when it does. So DCI, which is decompression illness, uh, to avoid this, we need to manage that nitrogen that we've absorbed. And the way we do this is we plan the dive using depth and duration. And to integrate that into the actual nitrogen management, we use either dive tables or dive computers. There's a little caveat to this, which is nitrox. So who here knows what nitrox is? Hands up. One, two. Not that many. OK, Oh, a couple more. So nitrox, as it kind of says in the name, is a combination of nitrogen and oxygen, which is very similar to air, funnily enough. But it has a higher percentage of oxygen and a lower percentage of nitrogen. So we take some nitrogen out of the air we breathe and put oxygen in its place. OK, so normally we have 21 percent oxygen and the other percent, 79 percent is nitrogen. We add more oxygen and reduce the nitrogen so we can have mixes ranging from 21 percent all the way up to 80 to 100 percent now as ocean divers all you need to know is night less nitrogen means a reduced risk of dci okay so that reduces our pressure gradient of nitrogen and so we absorb less nitrogen as divers and once you've completed the course you'll be qualified to use mixes up to 36 percent now this this mix percentage relates to the oxygen so it's 36 percent oxygen okay now we manage this decompression risk using dive tables it's the the simplest and least technological way of doing it and it's really important you understand the principles of this table because they're not massively simple, but it will allow you to understand how computers work and why they're doing what they are doing. OK, so it's a, it's a very basic understanding that's important. So before we get into the actual tables, let's do some quick definitions. Um, can anyone give me an idea of what the definition of depth is, either in the chat or speak up? You're more than welcome to, to unmute. Um, anyone can give me an idea of how we define depth. Distance below surface. Yeah, pretty much. It's the deepest depth reached during the dive. Yeah, it's the distance below the surface, absolutely. OK. This is going to be new to you guys. So we have certain restrictions on how quickly we can either go down or up. OK, the maximum descent rate, so how fast we can go down, is 30 meters per minute. That's still pretty quick. OK, you guys, if you go in Stony Cove, you'll probably be going 10 metres a minute ish. So 30 metres per minute is pretty fast. It's unlikely you'll actually even have to consider this because it's quite difficult to actually go that quick in water. On the other hand, your ascent rate is 15 metres per minute from six metres, OK, or up to six metres rather. 
So you can only go 15 meters up every minute. Now, this is something we have to consider. And the reason it's more tightly controlled is, as we said, nitrogen bubbles form if we go up too quickly. Once we get to that six meter point, we need to take at least one minute to go from six meters to the actual surface. OK, this is because in that six meter gap, that's where most of our off gassing occurs. And we want to spend lots of time doing that. OK, so we want to be extra safe. We also treat six meters in ascent check depth. So even if we just are going straight to the surface, apart from emergencies, we want to stop at six meters. Yeah. And check the dive time and the dive depth as well as the plan. OK. The reason we do this is because normally we or pretty much always we do a six meter safety stop for three minutes. So we stop at six meters for three minutes. Now, this isn't a decompression stop, so to speak, but it's just to make sure that we're safe and we spend lots of time at that six meters off gassing. OK. Now, dive time is the time from when we get in the water all the way along until we hit six meters, not until we get to the surface. OK, that's really important. You guys remember that because it isn't intuitive. So from the surface all the way down, do our dive, come back up to six meters. That time is the dive time. It's not from surface to surface. OK, so everyone remember that. It's quite important. So another fundamental concept before we actually see some tables is something called tissue codes. So we measure the amount of nitrogen in our tissues and by tissues, I mean muscle fibers and, and bodily parts. We call them tissues. Um, we measure how much nitrogen it is based on a code. OK, so we can have our current tissue code, which is the tissue code we currently are. And that represents how saturated we are with nitrogen. OK, and generally it's the starting point when you start planning a dive. OK, so you can see how it's labeled as the very start of the dive. And then at the end of the dive, once we've absorbed a load more nitrogen, we have something called surfacing code. So that's the code we get at the end of the dive. OK, now this code ranges from A to G, where A is the least amount of nitrogen absorbed and G is the most amount of nitrogen absorbed. So if I had a tissue code of A, I would have not been diving for 72 hours before. I have absolutely no extra absorbed nitrogen in my body. Whereas if I was at G, I would have just been on a really deep, long dive where I've absorbed loads of nitrogen. OK. Once we've done our dive and we've got out our surface code, we do a surface interval. OK, and that's partly because we want a bit of a break from the water because it's a bit cold and we're tired of doing it, but also because it gives time for that nitrogen to off gas from our body in air. Um, the air we breathe on the surface is at a lower pressure, and so the pressure gradient is greater going out of the body rather than in. So now we're off gassing that nitrogen. So the longer our surface interval, the more uh, the, the higher our code is. So let's say we came out at G. OK, so that's really saturated. The longer we stay on the surface, the higher we'll climb up this scale until eventually, after a, a couple of hours, we're going to be at A. OK. Once we've had this surface interval, we can calculate what tissue code will be on after the surface interval, and that gives us the new current tissue code or CTC for the next dive we do. OK. Hope that makes sense for everyone. If if at any point during this lecture you guys are lost, just put your hands up and and say what you're lost on because it is a slightly a, a bit of a step up from the last couple of lectures. So let's have a look at some actual tables. So considering we're only doing a single dive for now, as ocean divers, okay, we have a maximum depth of 20 meters. We also have a limit of no stop dives, and what that means is. There's two different types of diving. There's no stop dives and decompression dives. At a certain point, after you've spent a certain amount of time at a certain depth, you can go into something called decompression diving, which is where on ascent, you will need to stop at a certain depth for a certain amount of minutes to give nitrogen that you've absorbed time to off gas. As ocean divers, you don't need to worry about that because you're not meant to be doing decompression diving. 
so you can just go straight to the surface there's no decompression requirements okay apart from that six meter safety stop but that isn't mandatory you're not going to die if you go through that okay whereas decompression stops it's a bit dangerous if you start emitting those okay so on the table here we've got our, our air 21 percent oxygen table the reason it's green is this is actually from a nitrogen table so the ones you see might be blue instead but it's the same thing 21 percent oxygen so that's just normal air okay so for non-stop dives you see a title at the top big red box all you're interested in is the bright white area okay you're not interested in this right hand part of the table ignore that that's not there so as I said before, this is actually a nitrox table. You can dive up to 36% nitrogen, um, but if you want to be really conservative, you'll plan on air tables. Okay, why might that be? Has anyone got any ideas why that might be more conservative than than diving or, or planning on a nitrox table? It's always hard to tell if anyone's actually typing or if everyone's just stumped. Because you don't know what your body's diving on? Yeah, that could be a good point. I mean, it's something that we'd we'd address in the buddy check. We'd want to make sure that we know what gas our buddy's diving on. Um, most of the time you'll be diving on the same mix as your body, although sometimes they'll be on nitrogen, you won't, uh, not nitrogen, nitrox, uh, you won't be and vice versa. So yeah, it's a good point. It's definitely something we need to consider. What I'm trying to get at is because we know that nitrox has a lower percentage of nitrogen in it you will be uh, taking on less nitrogen for every minute you, sp you spend at that depth okay so that means if i'm diving on nitrox 36 my times for my no decompression limit are going to be higher so if i actually plan on an air table that's going to be more conservative because I'm assuming in reality, if I was diving on 36, I could have, you know, uh, let's let's see, uh, let's say for 21 meters, we'll, we'll get into reading these in a minute. I could have an hour of no decompression time, but on air, it only says 37 minutes. So it's more conservative to plan on air than on the nitrox. Now, in reality, I'd kind of advise you to actually use nitrox tables because that's what they're for. But it's just a point that you can you can pay attention to. Another feature of this table that's quite important for us is the table code. So as we mentioned in the previous slide, we have our tissue codes. Yeah. So this is table A. You see it's all highlighted. And this is for divers with a current tissue code of A. OK, now we have different tables for each tissue code. So they're labeled at the top, as you can see. And all they do is they account for what tissue code you're getting in the water with. OK. So a quick example of this. Let's say we want to plan a dive to nine meters for 17 minutes. Well, that animation is really badly placed. So nine meters for 17 minutes. So what we do is we look at the left hand column on the table, which is depth. We'd go down to nine meters. OK, and then go across until we find 17 minutes. Yeah, and then we would go down from there to the surfacing code and that tells us what surfacing code we're on okay so let's say the time or the depth is between the values given on the table yeah so going back a bit so we can see let's say i want to do a, a, a dive to 10 meters for say 45 minutes okay so going down that depth column you have three meters, six meters, nine meters, 12 meters. There's no 10 meters. So in diving, we're always taking a more conservative approach because it's safer. So although 10 is actually closer to nine, we're going to pick 12 because that's a more conservative option. So now we go on the 12 column or the 12 row rather all the way along. And we said 45 minutes dive time. So 10 minutes. No, not that. 37 minutes. No, not that. 87 minutes. So it's somewhere in between these two columns of 37 and 87. So we're going to pick 87 because it's the more conservative approach. OK, and then same again, we go down and we've got a tissue code of D. I hope everyone's followed that. If you haven't put your put your hand up. Um, but assuming that that's all clear, we'll do a very quick quiz. So 
typing in chat, fingers ready. First question is, what is dive time? How do we define dive time? Looks like everyone's getting the idea. So dive time is your time from leaving the surface to ascending to six meters. It is not surface to surface. OK, that's really important. You remember that. Second question. What is your surfacing code after your first dive of the day to 20 meters for 30 minutes? Now, I know you guys don't have tables, so I'll skip back to the previous slide so you can actually see it. Um, but everyone just jot down those details. So 20 meters for 30 minutes. Everyone remember that? So skipping back to the table. Um, I don't know if I can put a note on, I don't think so. So 20 meters for 30 minutes. What's our surfacing code? Getting a lot of E's, which is correctamundo. So for those who aren't quite sure, our depth we want is 20 meters. So we go all the way down, 15, 18, 21. So it's somewhere in between 18 and 21. OK, as we said, always conservative. So we go to 21 rather than 18 and then we follow that along. Until we find 30 minutes, so 13 minutes, 28 minutes, 32 minutes, it's so somewhere in between those two and we're more conservative. So we go for 32 minutes. OK, now we go all the way down that column. To the bottom where it says surfacing code is E. OK, does anyone not follow that? Put your hand up if you if you're struggling with that. It's perfectly fine, but just let me know and we'll we'll do another example. But if everyone's happy with that, we'll move on. I think everyone's happy with that. Okay, so the next question. <clears throat> what is your surfacing code after a first dive to 12 meters for 40 minutes? So jot down those numbers and we'll go back to the table. So surfacing code. Blimey, you lot quick. <laughs> so your surfacing code, what was the numbers? I've forgotten already. There you go, D, that's the right answer. Looks like most people have got the gist. Is anyone not sure on that? Please put your hand up now, because if you don't get it now, you're, you're never going to get it. So let us know and we'll do another example. But I think most people have got it, which is really good. Okie dokie. Is my beautiful assistant still there? Tom, are you still about? I am. Right, we're going to swap to Tom because Tom's got much more interesting things to say than me. Um, give us a minute just to fiddle with PowerPoints. So Tom, if you want to start doing yours. Yeah. Cool. Um, and... All right, can everyone see that? Yeah, it looks good. Looks good. All right, great. All right, yeah, cheers, Barney. Yeah, no worries. Um, so yeah, Barney's just taking you through how to use the dive tables to work out your max depth and um, sort of the times where you can stay. Um, and we have another table, which is called the service interval table, which is what we use to calculate um, sort of our, our um, current tissue code after our surface interval. So the way that we do this uh, is down the left hand column. It's got our last uh, dive surfacing code. So that's what you'd you'd put in. So say if I came out at like E, I'll just go down to um, to the E mark. And I'd, I'd go across the row to um, the amount of time which I'm going to spend out of water. And then I'll be able to read my surfacing code from that. So I will show you an example now. Yeah, E. So I'd go down to E across. So say I was going to spend five hours out, uh, out of water. And I'd go between four and ten hours and down. And there it says that my uh, my new uh, current 
tissue code will be uh, B. Uh, I can then use that for my next uh, diver plan, um, but then using the consequent table uh, B instead of uh, A, what we previously used. Uh, so when diving repeat dives, so your second dive of the day, generally we try and dive uh, a shallower um, second dive than our first. So this will allow you to actually dive for a longer period of time. Um, so get get more enjoyment out of the diving. Um, so yeah, you're selecting the table that matches your uh, your current tissue code. So after your surface interval. Uh, selecting your depth, just like what Barney's just taking you through, uh, and then read off the dive time. So I'll show you an example now. So currently, uh, if my current surface um, uh, tissue code was C, I would use table C, whereas it is, you can see at the top now, it says table C. If I wanted to dive at 15 uh, meters, uh, I'd go across, and then um, it says there, that my maximum dive time for 15 meters would be 24 minutes. And when I surface, it would give me a surface code of F. Does everyone sort of get the gist of that? You can put your hands up if um, to go over it again or. OK, great. Uh, so diving instruments. So we sort of know how to dive our, uh, how to plan our dives now. But now we need to actually follow the plan, and we do that by using uh, a range of different diving instruments uh, offered to us. So first up is our, our depth gauge. So we need to monitor actually how deep we're going in the water to sort of establish if we're meeting our maximum depth, what we've planned for. Uh, we need a watch to try and keep a track of time, so uh, we're not like overextending our periods of time at um, however deep you you plan to go. Uh, a dive slate. So you've probably seen the instructors use these uh, in the pool sessions. They're just like a plastic slab, um, which allow us to write on it and it doesn't wash off in the water. So these are really good because you can actually write your plan on them. So uh, it's just something to like remind uh, yourself back to what you're actually doing in the water. Um, and also it's a good idea to actually plan uh, multiple dives. So if you accidentally do uh, exceed your limits of depth or either time, then you actually do have backup plans um, to sort of run off. And then lastly, a gas analyzer. So this is when you're diving with a nitrox mix. You need to know actually what percentage of um, oxygen you're actually breathing, so then you can plan for that, um, which is a bit of a given. Yeah, just emphasize the fact that we plan the dive and then dive the plan. So it, it can sometimes be tempting to go deeper if you see like a wreck or a few meters deeper or even get distracted and dive for longer than you should have. Um, it's just important to try, try and try and stick with the plan what you've uh, what you've made. Uh, so moving on, so dive computers is our alternative to um, uh, our diving tables. Uh, so typically, uh, they're wrist mounted, but you can get ones uh, which are uh, mounted on an SPG. So where your uh, like pressure gauges, uh, as you can see on the picture, uh, they can have like inbuilt compasses, uh, which one on the, on the left does there, uh, whereas the one on the right doesn't. Uh, you can also get them where with like wireless transmitters, what can transmit how much air you have left uh, to your watch instead of having to read off of the uh, pressure gauge. Uh, so the functions of a computer is uh, calculate your nitrogen loading. So as a computer, what you actually dive with, it can continuously monitor your depth and time uh, in real time. Uh, so instead of just saying you're going to go down to 20 meters for so long, it'll actually calculate you going down and then slowly coming back up, um, which I'll get more into uh, in a few slides. Uh, so they provide planning information. Um, so after a dive, it will give you all the information what you need to plan the next dive. So it will uh, make a list of your uh, surface interval and your tissue codes. Uh, they also allow for a personal risk setting. So if you wanted to dive more conservative, then you can actually edit the calculation on some computers 
uh, to dive more conservative. Um, but that's just a personal sort of preference thing. Uh, they record uh, your depth, time and temperature. So this is continuous through the dive, uh, like I've mentioned. Uh, they give you uh, audible and screen warnings. So if you break any of the limits, if you break like your depth, time, ascent rate limit, uh, these things will go absolutely crazy at you and make you aware that you have uh, broken something. Um, yeah, they'll either start beeping at you or start flashing at you. Um, to get you to sort of fix whatever's uh, been broken. And then there's also uh, a log feature. So every dive you'd go, it sort of like inputs it into a log, which you can cycle back through and see sort of um, like depth and time and um, whatever it records in the dive. Uh, so planning on a dive computer. Um, so planning the first dive, your single dive planning, First of all, really important, you read the instruction manual. I can't really teach you how to plan on every single dive computer because there's a whole variety of different uh, different types. Um, but the instruction manual will give you everything you need. Uh, it'll tell you how to use it and all the different like warning little logos. Um, so it's definitely important to uh, to have a flick through that. Uh, but generally speaking, obviously we want to switch it on and go into the planning mode. You see on the button, press the button, it turns on. Um, so we're on planning mode on the bottom. Uh, we want to set the planned depth uh, by cycling through. So here we can see that I've got a max depth of 15 meters, and it's telling me that my uh, need uh, no deco time, so our no stop time, is 72 minutes at this depth, uh, and that's on an oxygen level of 21%. So that's just normal air. Um, and then if we're, if we're planning for a little bit longer, if we exceed um, our time uh, restrictions or if we exceed our depth restrictions, then we can go up and down the depths. So now you see it's on 12 meters. Now it's saying that I can dive for, uh, I can dive for 12, 124 minutes, sorry. And I can also go back up uh, to eight, uh, 18 meters where it will display uh, 52 meters, uh, no deco time. Uh, and then, yeah, use a slate to sort of plan out these different um, plans in case you do exceed uh, one of the restrictions. Uh, so for re repeat dive planning, so for your second dive, your computer will already know uh, your service interval. It, as soon as it sort of comes out of dive mode, it starts a timer for your service interval. You don't have to sort of record it and keep an eye. Uh, and then you're just doing the exact same thing as the first dive. So um, your computer will know your tissue code from the previous dive uh, and then calculate it with however long surface interval you had. Uh, so it just sort of streamlines the whole process. So you don't have to uh, be looking at different tables for different stuff. Um, and then, yeah, computers are linked to a single diver. So really, they shouldn't really be shared. Uh, we, we try and have a computer per diver. So when that's not always the case, um, the substitute is a uh, diving table, which we've been through. Um, and then, yeah, just to reiterate the fact, we plan the dive and then we try our best to dive the plan. Obviously, some things do uh, are inevitable, but we try and stick with the plan as much as we can. So moving on to table versus computers. So the actual difference between them, um, so the differences between our dive profiles. So in the picture, that's sort of like a generic diver profile. So we'd go down to the bottom, spend a little bit of time at the bottom, come up a little bit, spend a bit of time there, and then keep going shallower and shallower until we get to the surface. Whereas with, uh, if you plan with a dive table, it actually thinks that you're going to drop down to your deepest depth and then stay there for the entire dive, as you can see uh, with the red line there on the second picture. Um, so that gives us a square profile. So it doesn't give us any allowance in our diving uh, for shallower levels, which is where dive computers really come into play. Uh, because they're continuously recording our depth and times at them depths, uh, they allow for a variable or a multi-level profile. Um, so as you can see, 
uh, the third picture that sort of outlines what a, um, a dive computer would uh, record. So because they're sort of processing more data in real time, um, they're more generous than dive tables uh, if you spend some time uh, shallower. So this is because they're updating your nitrogen absorption continuously, um, depending on whatever depth uh, you are at the, uh, in, during the dive. So independent on whatever you're using, if you're using a table or a computer, we need to have a dive plan. So this is what a typical sort of dive plan might look like. Uh, so it's got your original plan, just a bit longer, just a bit deeper, and then worst case. And then it's got your start tissue code at the top, uh, your maximum operating depth, uh, which is MOD uh, for short, uh, and then your ascent check depth. So that's sort of like your six meter mark. You do your deepest dive first. I've mentioned um, this uh, in previous slides, uh, but we do this to try and maximize our no-stop time. Uh, we sort of take the benefit of being a lower um, surface um, code, a tissue code, uh, for our first dive, so we can go a bit deeper for a bit longer. Can I just interrupt there? Sorry. Um, although this is still uh taught on the training programs and you'll still find the majority of experienced divers saying this this is no longer actually valid uh, there's been research to show that this is entirely baseless and doesn't actually make a difference at all um, but we still put it in because they think it's safer for some reason so do just bear that in mind it isn't the cardinal sin that it used to be uh, of doing deepest dive second um, but do be aware that people will still believe that is a valid rule and they'll still dive to it. So just a little bit of surrounding information. Yep, cheers, Barney. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of a given this, but don't push the limits of the tables or computers. Uh, what they give you is sort of the best safety margins, what you can get. Uh, and if you're going to start just ignoring it, then that's just going to increase your risk of DCI exponentially. And also individuals uh, do actually differ in their susceptibility to decompression, uh, decompression illness. Um, so this is due to varying factors like age and uh, your fitness. Uh, so it is really important to try and keep a safety margin uh, when you're diving and not just dive completely to the limit. Uh, so start deep and progress to shallows. Uh, so this helps to minimize the uh, nitrogen loading in the body, um, just sort of relieves the pressure. Uh, so BSAC uh, tables, they actually tell us we're supp only supposed to do three dives uh, every 24 hours, so three dives a day. Um, but computers uh, may have, they may differ a little bit, but again, we just want to read the instructions for that because uh, depending on the model and variety and um, the algorithms, what they, the different algorithms, what they use, it will uh, vary quite a lot. Uh, and then buddies might have different profiles. You always want to adhere to the most conservative profile. So like I said, there's loads of different brands uh, of dive computers and they all run on slightly different algorithms. Uh, and some of them are more or less conservative. Um, so you want to dive to whatever is the most conservative dive watch between your, your sort of buddy pairings. Also, if your buddies have uh, done more dives than you that day, they've already done like a dive or two, then they're going to have a different tissue code than you and we're going to have to dive to a sort of different diving profile. So a little bit on the limitations of tables and computers. Uh, so they are there to minimize the risk of DCI, but it doesn't just completely eliminate it. These, uh, you know, DCI can happen even if you dive within limits. Although it's fairly rare, um, it can still happen. These things are just trying to minimize your risk of it happening. Um, a few of the risk factors that could uh, sort of influence your uh, DCI uh, is if you're cold. It could affect the um, sort of parameters, how the tissue codes are calculated uh, and just throw off the, um, the system. 
uh, alcohol and drugs. So this is more an interference with your thought process rather than sort of risky. Um, you could, you're more likely to make sort of mistakes in your diving, you know, go a bit deeper than you should have or stayed a bit too longer. Uh, and alcohol also dehydrates you, uh, which uh, increases your risk. Buoyancy control, uh, so it can prevent the appropriate sort of ascent or descent rate uh, if you're like flying up or just sinking straight to the bottom. Uh, it can also prevent your ascent check depth stop. So that's your six meter mark. If you're getting to six meters and then you're just completely lose, losing your buoyancy and just shooting up to the surface, you know, that, that is going to increase your risk. So that's what we try and aim for really good buoyancy control. And then sawtooth profiles. So these are just like lots of ups and downs, sort of like a six meter range plus. Uh, so that's sort of going down six meters, back up six meters, back down six meters. So these sort of um, profiles, they compromise the calculations of the computers and the tables and just throw it off. And um, yeah, it just increases your risk. Can I just interrupt on the cold and the alcohol drugs front? Um, cold, what what happens to our circulation when we get cold? Any ideas? Uh, I'm sure some of you have got terrible circulation, especially when it gets cold. You'll probably find that your extremities get poor circulation because your body is trying to maintain warmth in your core. And what that means is the blood supply to those extremity, uh, ex extremities, ugh, I can't say it, those, the blood supply is totally different to what's normally there. And so the computer, which is planning on a, on a normal blood supply, is going to be totally different to what it actually is. So that's why cold can affect that. Um, alcohol and drugs, Tom's absolutely right. Alcohol doesn't seem to have an effect on your susceptibility to DCI apart from you behaving like a bit of a muppet. Uh, we have had people turn up to the pool drunk before and they have been turned away and removed from the club. So tell that as a bit of a warning. Um, the drug side of it is interesting because there's so many different drugs out there, not just illegal drugs, we're talking about medical drugs. Um, and the truth is we just don't know how they react to DCI and nitrogen and the susceptibility to that. Um, we know a lot of the common ones like birth control and, and depression, uh, antidepressants and that sort of stuff have no effect. But the more unique stuff that control medical conditions that are a little bit less common, um, we're not actually sure how they react, which is why a lot of the conditions you'll find on the medical form aren't actually to do with diving. It's to do with the medication we use to control those conditions. So it's just a, a little point about the drugs. It's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just sometimes we're not really sure. That's all. Carry on, Tom. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, next up, individual susceptibility. So things that will influence this is your fitness, uh, the sort of exertion, what you're having to go through if there's like a tide or a current. Uh, dehydration will uh, affect you. Uh, and also, so your predispositions. So this links back to what Barney just mentioned. So medical factors which can increase your risk. Uh, they are detected in the diving medical form um, and often just result in sort of trying to do a more conservative dive. So diving at altitude, so your absorption and the release of nitrogen is affected by your altitude and therefore we have to use different tables. So a level one table is for sea level. Uh, so this is 984 millibar of pressure or more. Uh, if we, when we move to levels two, three and four, so this is indicating that we're at a higher level uh, of altitude, uh, which means that we're suffering from a lower atmospheric pressure, which will then change the absorption and release, uh, and release of the nitrogen. Uh, this does require additional training and more info will be given in sort of a separate module if you choose to go down that. Um, yeah, when to use the other levels. So actually, when you're traveling to and from dive sites, if you're having to travel sort of up and down like hills or mountains, that can actually affect your tissue code and therefore affect your, your planning. 
well as if you're if you're living or if you're diving at an increased altitude, that's obviously going to um, have an effect. Uh, so inland sites in bad weather. So if there is a like a really strong low pressure weather system, uh, which is sitting above your dive site, that is actually going to affect um, your dive planning. Um, so it's just something else to to think about. And then flying. Stony Cove is actually one of those places as well. Um, in really bad weather, Stony Cove can be a level two dive table rather than level one. Yeah, so at that point, you'd want to sort of move over from the level one table, swap over to level two, and do your planning off that. Uh, and then flying, which we'll get onto on the next slide. Uh, again, computers and altitudes, read your instruction manual. They'll tell you specifics about um, the dive computer, what you have. So diving a bit more into uh, flying. So flying before diving. Uh, your tissues off gas uh, while flying uh, and it can take some time to actually return to the normal nitrogen levels. Uh, the stresses of flying. So if you get sort of really stressful with the thought of flying, you might get a bit disorientated, a bit tired, a bit nervous, uh, irritability, dehydration, all these sort of things increase your risk for DCI. Uh, so if you do get a bit stressful when flying, uh, it's probably a better idea to have a little bit of uh, more of a surface interval before you actually start your diving, sort of allow your body to, to settle. And then recovery before diving. So it'd be such, say, a 10 hour minimum. Um, if you can't complete that 10 hour minimum, uh, they say to use uh, table B of the um, altitude uh, instead. So flying after diving, uh, you've got an increased level of off-gassing. So the majority of your nitrogen release is actually done on the surface, not in the water. Uh, and the reduced pressure on planes uh, will cause uh, your, the nitrogen bubbles sort of in your tissues and blood uh, to expand or even sort of form more, um, which will increase your risk of DCI. So that's why we um, sort of don't, don't uh, go flying straight after you're diving. Uh, so yeah, your stresses are flying the same as flying before. Yeah, ensure your long surface intervals between uh, your last dive. So BSAC uh, dive tables say do not fly within 24 hours of your last dive. Um, and from the tables, they require your tissue code to be the A or B. Uh, so you need a tissue code of B if you're going to be traveling in a pressurized aircraft or uh, you need a tissue code of A if you're going to be in a pressure, uh, non-pressurized aircraft, sorry. And then again, computers follow your instructions. Uh, computers will tell you when not to fly. So on my computer, I have, uh, whenever I surface, uh, I get a little sort of plane and it says no next to it. Uh, so whenever that light is on, just telling me do not get an aircraft. Uh, so yeah, oxygen toxicity. So oxygen can actually be toxic uh, at high partial pressures. Uh, we, you will sort of dive more into this when you do your sports dive, of course. It sort of just briefly sort of lets you know that, you know, this is a, is a possibility uh, in the ocean dive, of course. And um, the high partial pressures of oxygen actually determines your uh, max operating depth, so how, how deep you can actually go uh, with the air mixes you have. Um, so with nitrox, so we've said that it reduces your DCI risk because you're actually breathing in uh, less nitrogen. So if you're going to be breathing like a 36%, uh, you've traded sort of 15% nitrogen for 15% oxygen. So you're just not taking in as much nitrogen. But then you're, you're breathing in even more oxygen. So that increases your risk for then oxygen toxicity. Uh, but for ocean divers, you know, your guys' max depth is 20 meters. Um, so you shouldn't be going any deeper than 20 meters anyway. Um, but with different sort of nitrox mixes, you have different max depths. So the higher the percentage of oxygen, 
uh, sort of the shallower you can sort of die, go when you're diving. So with your dive computer settings, uh, you can actually set your dive computer for the gas mix that you're using. Um, so as Barney mentioned, so you, you can set your dive computer just to stay at air. Uh, so this is a much more conservative method because uh, as it was mentioned, uh, the computer thinks you're actually breathing in more nitrogen than you actually are. So then you've sort of got just a bigger buffer, bigger um, safety margin in your diving. Obviously, the preferred sort of saying is to actually tell your computer what you're breathing, because at that point it can give you actually your dive time what you, you can dive to. Uh, but obviously, this comes with sort of a, a less safety margin, which may increase your risk to uh, decompression illness. So moving on, so gas consumption. Uh, so we've talked about sort of planning the dive. We've also got, got to be a bit mindful of our gas. It was a bit of a given. We need enough gas for the dive. Uh, if you're going on a dive, what needs sort of 210 bar? Make sure you've got 210 bar. We also need a good reserve. So we need enough to the dart for the dive, but we need enough for, for our reserve to, uh, in case of an emergency. So the way that we do this is uh, we have the rule of thirds. So how this works is that we use one third of our tank for going out. So that includes our descent and our first half of the dive. Uh, it can also be used as an indicator as a turning point in the dive. So when you reach that sort of two thirds mark of your gas consumption, that's that can sort of indicate you, OK, I need to turn around and swim back. Then use the second third uh, for the second half of the dive or the return um, and then the ascent back to the surface. And then when we're at the surface, that's when we should be sort of having that one third remaining uh, in case of an emergency. Uh, so a quick example of this. Uh, so say we're starting at 210, which is sort of the generic start level uh, of most tanks. So we're going to turn around at 140 bar. So obviously 210 divided by three uh, is 70. Um, so at that 140 bar is your two thirds mark uh, left of your tank. So that's when we need to start turning around or just indicate that is you're now sort of diving into the second half uh, of your dive. And then when we get to the surface, we want to keep that sort of 70 bar reserve, that one third of the tank. Always aiming to surface with one third of your gas. So because um, situations can occur whenever in the dive. Um, so if you do have sort of an emergency situation where you have to do maybe like an, uh, an AS ascent, which we covered in the pools, um, or we started to cover in the pools uh, two weeks ago, you're going to have two people breathing off one gas cylinder. So your gas is going to sort of deplete much quicker than just you. So that's why we have um, that sort of reserve, that 70 bar reserve. So 50 bars is an absolute minimum. If there's any less, it's just not enough for an emergency. Uh, so even for whatever reason, if you started your dive at 120 bar, then your reserve still needs to be 50, uh, regardless of the of the rule of thirds. Uh, so yeah, gas monitoring. Uh, so your 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 gas your uh, cylinder is your lifeline. Is what you're breathing out of. So we need to regularly monitor this. Because uh, we shouldn't be running low or out of gas under normal uh, diving conditions, unless there's a situation um, where there's an emergency. You know, we shouldn't be running the tank dry. Uh, it is also important to be mindful that your gas consumption can increase when you're diving. Uh, so physical effort increases. So if you're fighting currents, if you're having to swim faster to try and keep up with your buddy, you're going to be breathing more gas quicker. Uh, but also when divers are cold or anxious. Uh, so the first time what I actually experienced sort of struggled to equalize my ear on a dive, I actually guzzled my uh, my air because I was actually quite a bit anxious about um, sort of uh, damage to my ear or whatever. Uh, so I, end, I actually ended up surfacing with 70 bar and my buddies were still on like 110, 120. So it actually does make quite a bit difference um, 
if you are a little bit anxious about the diet for that day. If the gas consumption is more than sort of you're expecting, obviously we need to shorten that dive or in like sort of extreme circumstances, um, just terminate the dive where it's not safe. So that brings us to quiz number two. Uh, so question one is how deep can an ocean diver go on 32% nitrox? You guys want to um, put a message in the chat? Yes. Yep, so you guys are absolutely correct. So 20 meters uh, is your max deep for an ocean diver, uh, regardless of whatever mix of gas you are using. Uh, moving on to question two. So how much gas should be held in the reserve? Yep, one third. Yeah, perfect. So we want that one third reserve, but no less than 50 bar. And final question. So what are the risk factors for decompression illness? you a minute or so more get your answers in the chat okay yeah you guys are on the right track uh, so poor buoyancy control, so that's uh, uncontrolled sort of ascent and descent. Uh, being cold, absolutely correct. Uh, dehydration uh, will contribute towards uh, your risk of DCI. And then, of course, alcohol and drug consumption. Uh, so as a quick summary, so we've been through sort of the practicalities of dive planning, planning. Uh, so hopefully you guys know how to plan a dive now using the uh, BSAC tables. Uh, we sort of know the dive instruments, what we use to follow our plan. The differences between uh, tables and computers. So that's uh, your dive profiles. Um, we talked about altitude and diving, sort of how we can um, sort of plan against that. Flying and diving. Our oxygen toxicity limits. Uh, and then finally, we've uh, touched on some gas consumption planning in our rule of thirds. Brings us to the end of today's lecture. Fantastic. Um, so, does anyone have any questions about anything we've covered today at all? Please either unmute yourself or type in the chat. We'll answer anything you've got. Um, that is the end of the lesson for today. Obviously, we don't have a pool session this week and we won't have one until the end of lockdown. We're working with the university to work out whether we'll actually be able to get back in the pool this term. Uh, as soon as we know anything, we'll be updating you guys through email and through the Facebook page as well. 
Um, the recordings for these lectures are all uploaded onto our YouTube channel and I've literally just put the link in the description of the uh, Ocean Diver group. So if you just go on the Facebook Ocean Diver group in the description, there's a link to the playlist with all of the, the previously recorded uh, lessons. Um, once again, just remind you, please do sign up to the easy fundraising uh, donations because it's a massive help to us uh, and only a few of you have done it so far. So the link is on the on the Facebook group again. And remember that we've got a social next week, Wednesday after this session. So about this time, uh, probably around seven or eight o'clock. And it's all in aid of a charity, RNLI. So definitely worth going to. Uh, so just one question. Could you maybe go over the inland diving in bad weather part, please? And why we'd need to use a different level of dive for table. Uh, do you want me to do that, Tom, or are you happy doing it? Um, I mean, you can go over it if you want. You probably know more about it. Okay. Um, let me tell you what. Let me just do something. So, inland dive sites. Um, the 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 thing. The reason they're uh, kind of isolated from ocean diving in that regard is because inland dive sites can do something that the sea can't really do, which is be at altitude. Um, the sea is always at sea level. That's kind of the point of it. Whereas your inland dive sites such as Stony Cove, there's one up north called Cape and Ray. Uh, there's a load of different ones all over the country. They can be at different altitudes to each other and to the sea. <clears throat> so Stony Cove is a certain hundred meters or so above sea level. Um, and that can be different between them because all they are is flooded holes in the ground. So they can be at different altitudes. So what that means is the, the atmospheric pressure at that point can be different from sea level. So at sea level, you're always going to have a certain amount of atmospheric pressure. But the further we go up in the atmosphere, our atmospheric pressure, so the pressure of the air, reduces. Does, does that make sense? Because um, that's kind of a fundamental part of why this is important. So if, as we go up Everest, the atmospheric pressure reduces, which is why they all wear... Uh, oxygen masks going up Everest yeah um, and then because of that pressure difference as Tom said about the different levels of tables um, we're going to need to consider that pressure change now most places that we go diving on the inland sites in the UK they're still not high enough to make a meaningful change in the pressure so we can still assume that we can use level one um, but weather is very dependent on the atmospheric pressure. And for those who don't know, high atmospheric pressure means good weather, sunny, nice, no, not a lot of clouds, high temperature. And low pressure means bad weather, so like clouds and rain and cold and all that. And there's localized areas of high and low pressure and they move around the planet. And that's how our weather forms as a system. OK, so at the moment today, we've got quite low pressure. Um, and that can have an overall effect on which table we use, because if you have a site like Stony Cove that's on the borderline of level one and level two because of the altitude, and then also has a low pressure weather system over the top of it, that combines and then pushes it into level two. Um, so if you wanted to find out this information, you can actually go on BBC Weather. And if you go on a particular day at a particular time and click on it, you can see the pressure in millibars. Um, so if you wanted that information, you can find that and it does do it locationally. So if you go on BBC Weather and find Stony Stanton, which is the closest town for Stony Cove, it will tell you the pressure on the day at the time at that particular location. So that's probably the best resource for, for figuring that out. I hope that answers all of that question relatively comprehensively. Um, if anyone else is not sure about that, just speak up and we'll answer it. Cool. Uh, any other questions at all from anyone? Say so that's a no. Um, so we'll be back here next week, same time uh, on Teams again. You'll get an invite probably Sunday and we'll be going over the next lesson in the series. Um, once again, social next week as well. Sign up to Easy Fundraising and we'll see you all next week thanks for coming guys see you later yep, see you next week cheers guys